right, you may be seated, and man, great to see you here today. For those of you maybe who don't know me, my name is Alan, and I'm the pastor here at One Life, and if I haven't had a chance to meet you, I'd love to do that, so please come find me after the service. I'll be milling around around here. We'd love to, to see you again, and or maybe for the first time, put a name to your face, and so, uh, man, praise the Lord. What a, what a great... What a great opportunity and privilege we have to worship God, amen? Uh, aren't you thankful that we live in a place where we can gather freely and, and just sing our praises to him who deserves so much and so much more than we could ever offer him? You know, not everywhere in the world can you do that, right? Not, not, not freely anyway. And so we're blessed here and uh, want to make sure that we take advantage of the opportunity that we have. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to find 2 Peter chapter 1. Verses 5 through 7, we're going to read those. Uh, this is a place where we have been studying for the last several weeks, and we've got a couple more weeks after this one. Um, we are, we've titled this series Faith Plus. Faith Plus, meaning that according to Scripture, specifically Peter, as led by the Holy Spirit, has let us know that as followers of Jesus, that faith in Christ is a great first step in our journey in our relationship with Him, Right? that we don't just stop with faith. In fact, that's the beginning of our journey, but there are things that we should be adding, excuse me, to our faith as those who want to grow and to know him more and to become more and more like him. And so specifically in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, Peter says there are certain things that you should be adding to your faith. You should be doing so diligently, he says, and we'll read the passage in just a moment. So we've already seen that in addition to coming to faith in Jesus, we should add things like virtue, meaning moral excellence. We should be adding and growing in our knowledge of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We should be adding to our faith self-control, right? Learning to let the Spirit lead us day by day. Uh, we were talking this morning, uh, Toby and I, and he said, you know, the, the scripture that says, if you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And what you're doing when you do that is you're giving over control of your life to the control of the Holy Spirit living in you as a follower of Jesus. And you become more and more like him as you do that more and more. Last week we talked about adding to our faith perseverance or patience or endurance. And so today we're going we're gonna to talk about godliness. So if you like to take notes, I know a lot of you do. Um, you could put that word maybe at the top of your page. Godliness is the next thing that he says that we should be adding to our faith. Um, let's read the passage and then we'll kind of get into our conversation this morning about godliness and what that means and what that should look like in your life and mine. But let's read where the Word of God says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. Peter says, But also for this reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness. And if you want to see where we'll be over the next couple of weeks, verse 7, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. And so, as usual, what I'd like to do is start this morning kind of talking about, like, what, uh, maybe a definition. What, what do we mean when we talk about adding godliness to our faith? I was reading this week, and um, it, it was just interesting, you know, even talking with Nisa, our administrative assistant in the office, about adding godliness. It's a word that maybe, as a believer, you would use regularly, right? Or uh, we use the word godly, being a godly person, or godly man, a godly woman. But really, just to succinctly put, like, like what does that mean, right? What does that, what does that look like? Uh, it was kind of a, a, a challenge, you know, to, to be able to say that succinctly. And so uh, I want us to, I want to help you with that because it took me a little while to get there. In fact, I'm going to give you kind of a two-word definition of godliness and then, and then we'll kind of, you know, unpack that a little bit. But uh, maybe in your notes you'd like to write, what, when we talk about godliness, what do we mean by that term? Adding that to our faith. So the two words I want to give you are practical piety. Practical piety. Piety. Now, I'm sure piety is not a word that you use this week or probably even this month, right? I mean, not a, not a real common word, but essentially the word piety, it refers to reverence specifically of God. Like a deep reverence and respect for God because of who He is and, and because of what He has done. So when we talk about adding godliness 
to our faith and virtue and these other things, we're talking about practical piety or reverence of God. And, and you probably, just with the two words, you notice there are two really important components to this idea of godliness. There's the attitude side of it. That's what piety speaks to. And then there's the action side of it. That's the practical part of it, right? So there's the attitude of, of godliness, and then there's the action of godliness. So let's talk about the attitude for a moment. Like I said, we're talking about a deep respect for God because of who he is and because of what he has done. And what I want to make sure that we don't miss here as we talk about godliness, and especially kind of the word piety, because it sounds, I, I would say it almost has a negative connotation these days, though it shouldn't. Um, it, we're talking about an attitude that is directed toward God and not toward others. Right? Does that make sense? When we talk about godliness, we're, in other words, we're, we're not talking about a holier-than-thou attitude, right? Like, I'm not looking at my life and comparing my life to yours or my life to, you know, whoever else or this person's life to someone else. When we talk about adding godliness, we're talking about an attitude of reverence toward God, right? That's the direction of our attitude. Uh, Jesus was never about believers comparing themselves to other believers, right? Um, in fact, in Luke chapter 18, I want to go there and just remind us of a little passage here. It, it's actually a parable. Uh, Jesus told this story, which was a very real-life story. No doubt this was happening regularly. That's why he talked about it. But in Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14, he sort of gives a little you know, parable about someone who was comparing themselves to another. And, and you'll see his attitude was not, was not positive at all about that. So in Luke 18, verse 9, so it says this, um, Also he, that's Jesus, spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. Sometimes the word righteous and godliness, they get, they get used interchangeably. There's a little bit different connotation there. But, you know, so someone who trusted that they were righteous and they despised others. And he goes on to say, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. So in your mind, a Pharisee, this would be a really super religious person. And the tax collector, any Jew listening to that, they would have despised the tax collector, right? They were, they were going to be people that were cheating people and robbing other people and walking contrary to God. And they were very selfish and greedy and so on. So you have a really religious person and the one who's just really not, right? And they're going to go in and they're going to pray. And they probably already are imagining how the story's going to go. And so then Jesus says in verse 11, the Pharisee stood and he prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and even as this tax collector, you see what he's doing, comparing himself to others, he says in, in verse 12, I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I possess, and he's thankful to God that he's all that, right, religiously speaking. And then in verse 13, he says, and the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, probably any of the Pharisees listening to the story were going, yeah, man, that's like, what's the problem, right? And Jesus goes on to describe for them what the problem is. I tell you, this man, speaking of the tax collector, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Major slap in the face of all the really religious Jewish people there at the time. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, uh, the lawyers, they were called at that time, who you know, knew and, and did their best to keep the law of God. Nothing wrong with that. But when you begin to think in yourself more than you ought to think, you have a problem. So godliness is not about comparing yourself to others. Uh, it's not about holier than thou. It's an attitude of reverence and respect toward God. Like, as, as I said, because of who he is and what he has done. Well, who is he? Well, he is the creator amongst many other things. Right? He is your creator personally. You exist because God, right? You ever thought about that? You exist. I mean, I realize there's some biology that happens and chemistry and, and all that. That's just the way that God does his work. You exist because God is your creator and he wanted you to be alive. Well, who else is he? Well, he's also your savior. Maybe I should ask that as a question. Is he your savior? <laughs> Hopefully he is. Do you know Jesus personally? 
It's God's desire to not only be your creator, but your savior. In fact, he sent Jesus into the world to be the savior of the world, specifically the savior of all who would place their faith and trust in him. He's not going to force that on you. He's creator, he's savior. He made us and he died for us to give us eternal life. That is who he is and that is what he has done. And so that should generate in us like this attitude of deep respect and reverence for him as God and as Savior. So that's all wrapped up in this word godliness. But it's not just an attitude, right? There's more to godliness than just an attitude. There's also the action. And this is why we're defining godliness as practical piety, right? In other words, the attitude in your heart and mind for who God is and what he has done, it's got to work its way out in your life practically, If it doesn't, again, there's a problem. See, no one would describe someone as a godly person if if their life didn't give evidence of their deep respect for God. You see what I'm saying? In other words, it it has to be not just in your head and in your heart, but it has to work its way out. Let me show you a a passage here in Titus, Titus uh, chapter 2. So Titus is a letter uh, from the Apostle Paul to a pastor. His name was Titus. And Paul had sent him on a mission on the island of Crete at the time to sort of set the church in order and get them all organized so that they could do what God had called them to do with maximum efficiency. By the way, if you hear, ever, ever hear somebody say, why just I'm not really about organized religion or an organized church? Well, just know that like God specifically sent people to go organize churches so that together they could do the most possible for for God and for his kingdom. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. So Paul's writing this letter. Look at what he says to Titus, verse 11, chapter 2. He says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope And glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people. Watch what it says next. Zealous for good works. Verse 15. Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. By the way, so if you ever go to church and you feel like the pastor's kind of yelling at you, you know, just, just know his heart. He's, he's doing what God says. Like, he's exhorting you. He's challenging you. He might even be rebuking you, hopefully in love, hopefully, hopefully with humility, hopefully based on the foundation of the sure rock of the word of God and the person of Jesus Christ. But that's part of who he is and what he's supposed to be doing, right? Um, but I want you to not miss that Paul says to Titus, hey, look, we're supposed to reject ungodliness, And then we're supposed to live a certain way, righteously and godly. He said, this should be demonstrated in your good works. In other words, it doesn't do any good to kind of have this deep reverence for God if it doesn't actually impact the way that you live your life. In fact, we have words for people like that. Well, the point is this. Um, Godliness is primarily toward God. Righteousness is primarily toward others. In fact, did you notice in the verse he says righteousness and godliness. Godliness is toward God. Righteousness is toward... But but one bleeds over into the other. In other words, if you are a godly person, you have this deep respect for God that affects the way that you live, guess what happens? Now you are living righteously toward others as well. One overflows into the other. And you need both components of godliness for that to actually be godliness you need to have the right attitude toward god that needs to impact the way that you live your life toward god and eventually toward others as well otherwise in other words if it's just in your head and heart but it's not working its way out of your life what what do we what do we call those kind of people Uh, hypocrite Right? I mean, like they say one thing, they think one thing, but they're, but like they don't live that way. Right? I mean, we call them hypocrites. Now, thankfully, you know, churches don't know anything about that. We never get accused of hypocrisy in the church, right? I mean, that's why we preach these things. That's why we talk about them. 
right here. Because actually, the message is directed toward us, right? I mean, God, through the Spirit and through Peter, is saying, hey, you, as a Christ follower, need to be adding godliness to your life more and more all the time. It can't just be in your heart and head. It's got to be working its way out in the way that you live your life in the world around you. Um, James talks about this, um, and, and the way he talks about it is in terms of faith and works, right? You remember that? James chapter 2, let me read to you. James 2, verses 18 to 20. James describes it like this, and, and I really think this is essentially what we're talking about when it comes to godliness. James 2, verse 18. He says, but someone will say, you have faith, and I have works, right? And, and he's sort of speaking like, 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 um, what's the right, sarcastic though? Oh, you, some people say, well, you have faith, I have works. And James is going to talk about that. He's going to say, show me your faith without your works. Go ahead, try that. Like, show me that. What, what's that look like, really? He goes, I will show you my faith by my works. See what he's saying? Watch what he, he goes on to say. You believe that there is one God. Right? It's in your heart and it's in your head. You believe that. Hey, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Right? You know, like James is getting a little feisty here. He says, hey, that's great. You believe in God? Hey, good for you. Demons do too. And the way I say sometimes, so what makes you, what makes me, what makes us any different than a demon if we just say, oh, I believe in God? Oh, congratulations. <laughs> you and all the demons. <laughs> so, so what's the difference then? Well, one is, it's got to work its way out. See, we wouldn't call demons godly, would we? Just because they believe in God. Trust me, they have a deep reverence for God. In fact, the Bible says, even the demons believe, and they tremble. They're scared of him. They've seen him. They know his power. They fear and reverence in ways that we should. The problem is, they don't submit to him. And so they haven't given their lives to him. They don't honor him and worship him. But do you want to know... Watch what James says. Oh, foolish man. Oh, foolish man. Do you want to know that faith without works is what? It's dead. It's dead. So some think that, you know, um, in fact, Pastor Justin and I met a guy this week. He, you know, he's going to read a passage like this and go, see, you've got you to gotta, you gotta have works in order to be saved. You know, well, I, I don't think that's what James is saying. He's saying, if you say you have faith in God, you say you have this deep respect and, and love for God, but it doesn't actually work its way out in your life. I, I don't, I'm not sure that's faith. Because that faith, that's, that's dead. That, that's not really working out anything. So it's got to be in your heart. It's got to be an attitude of deep respect for God. Godliness we're talking about. Deep respect for God that works its way out in your life. It's faith and works. So um, I would say, I think, and it's fair biblically to kind of come to the conclusion that godliness is really putting your faith into practice, right? Putting your faith into practice. Not just talking about it, not just thinking about it, not just telling someone you believe, but actually putting your belief, your faith into practice. Practical piety. You see how that works? Godliness. And so that's what James is saying. We need to be adding to our faith. So here's what I want to do with the rest of our time this morning. I want to, I want to give you four I'll call them, I guess, characteristics of godliness or of a godly person that hopefully will help us be able to kind of grab a hold of this idea and, and really do what he says to do. Giving all diligence, add this to your life as a Christ follower. So that really makes a difference in your life and in the lives of the people that, that maybe would observe you and therefore give you opportunity to talk to them about Christ who's making a difference in your life. So four characteristics of godliness. You might write it on your page like this. Godliness is, right? Godliness is, let me give you four things. And I'm going to take you to a passage of scripture with each one. Godliness is, first of all, a way of life. It's a way of life. Now we're going to see this, if you want to find it, in 1 Timothy. So again, this is a letter that Paul wrote to another pastor. His name's Timothy, obviously. He wrote a couple of letters to him. And in fact, you're going to find the word godly or godliness more times in the New Testament right here in the letters that Paul wrote to Timothy and to Titus than anywhere else in the New Testament. And so we're just going to kind of work our way through here, uh, 1 Timothy a little bit, and, and we'll, I think we'll see all four of these uh, things that I want to share with you right here in this letter that Paul wrote to Timothy about godliness. So in, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, 
verses 1 and 2, again, the point I want you to see, godliness, when we talk about diligently adding this to our faith, we have to understand this is a way of life. 1 Timothy 2, verse 1, therefore, I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life. So we're going to pray that we can lead this kind of life. So we're going to pray for our authorities so that we can lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and reverence. So Paul's saying we should pray so that we can live godly lives. Right? And he says in all godliness. Um, it, it, that's an adjective that describes the all-encompassing nature of the godly living that we should be doing. It's in every area of our life. Another translation says it this way, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Right? In other words, it encompasses every area of your life. The point is this, it's a way of life, right? Godliness is not just about Sundays. It's about all the days. Right? Godliness isn't just, you know, I, I show up once a week to, to meet with some other folks and we're going to do what we do. But it's about every single day of your life working out the faith that you say you have in Jesus. And, and, and trust me, I do believe that gathering with the body is important, right? I mean, we've been encouraging you that, especially now for the last year, right? And more and more, hey, come on, it's important that we gather together on Sundays, on Wednesdays, on Thursdays, that we do that regularly, that we operate as the body of Christ. Of course we believe that's important, but godliness should impact every area of your life as a Christ follower. It's a way of life. Well, like, like what are we talking about? Well, like, like it should impact your marriage, right? The way that we treat each other as husband and wife should be impacted by the deep reverence that we have for God. And, and because of that, I should act and speak in certain ways towards my wife or your husband, your spouse. It should impact our marriages. Um, godliness should impact the way that we raise our kids. In other words, we see what God says about that. And we put that into practice in the way that we, as the scripture says, in, in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's how we're training them up. We're paving the path for them to come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, which, by the way, parent, you can't do that for them, and you can't guarantee that they ever get there either, but you can pave the way, and, and, and you can paint the picture, and you can live out a model of what it looks like to follow hard after Jesus, and prayerfully, you are living your life so that they will come to know Christ personally by the way that you raise your children, um, our godliness, our, our attitude and our action as followers of Jesus should impact maybe our work ethic, whether that's the, the way that we work at our job or the way that we work as students at school. If you're in a dating relationship, what God says should be working out and impacting the way that that relationship is carried about. In other words, we listen to what God says and we let him govern the way that we're going to think and behave as far as it concerns the way that we are in a dating relationship if you're single with others. Our social behaviors, our language that we use with one another, the, the way that we deal with our finances, the, the way that we uh, carry out our friendships should all be governed and directed by the Spirit through the Word. Godliness, it's a way of life, and it impacts everything you do. It's not just religious-looking behavior. It's the way you think, it's the way you behave every single day, every single moment of your life. Godliness, add that diligently to your life every single day, moment by moment. So godliness is a way of life. It's also, we're going to see here again in, in Timothy, it's also a personal truth. It's a personal truth. I want you to see this in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 to 16. Here Paul continues writing to Timothy and he says, these things I write to you. Though I hope to come to you shortly, but if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God. See, it's not just an attitude, it's also action. Which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. Now watch what he says here. Something really, uh, I'll say kind of strange on the surface. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. And then he goes on to say, God 
was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in glory. This is the mystery of godliness. Well, what in the world does that mean? <laughs> I don't know. It's a mystery, right? The Bible says. Well, here's the thing. The word mystery, when it's used in the Bible, it, it, here's what it means. It means a truth that was hidden, but has now been revealed. That's what Paul, it, like, is revealed to us, right? It's a mystery. It was hidden from our knowledge, but now it's been revealed to us. Well, let me ask you this, and, and I don't think you're going to have any trouble figuring this out. When we read verse 16, the mystery of godliness, who is Paul speaking about in, when he says God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in glory? Who is that? Jesus, right? You guys are all Bible geniuses. I mean, it's Jesus. That's who he's talking about. This is the mystery of godliness. And so here's what I want us to not miss. As, as people, we have no hope of living a godly life apart from God living in us, specifically apart from the person of Jesus Christ. In other words, if you desire, if there's anything in you that desires to live a godly life, to, to look more and more like Christ, then it is obvious that he has to live in you. You have to have received him. You have to have taken a step into that relationship by faith, right? In other words, godliness is not like some abstract concept. It is not just a code of conduct. You, you follow what I'm saying? When Peter says, you know, add to your faith godliness, he's not like thinking just like pull out a list of things to do and to not do. Though we've already said, we're going to do and not do certain things because of our deep respect for God. So it's very practical, but it's not about the list. It's about the person of Jesus Christ. That's why I say it's a personal truth. So when you see him saying, add godliness, don't immediately think of things you can do and, and can't do. Think of the person that is living inside of you, that you love, that you worship, that you honor, that gave his life for you. And as a result, you're willing to give your life back to him. And you're willing to trust him with how you ought to live your life. To bring glory and honor to him. So that you can have a great marriage. So that your dating relationship is all that it should be. Hopefully leading in the direction of marriage. Because that's really what that's about. So that you're raising your kids in a way that honors God. And that promotes health and well-being in their lives. Because you're doing things God's way. So the point here is that essential to godliness is a personal relationship with Jesus. He said of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. It's a personal truth. That's what godliness is about. So don't ever think of it just as like a list. It's all about the person of Jesus. Godliness is a personal truth. It's also a discipline. So again, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Uh, again, I was in a conversation with someone just kind of about the series that we're in right now, Faith Plus. And, and, and certainly some of these things that we've been looking at, I mean, God has to be working in us, right? And he has to be doing these things in us. Apart from him, we're never going to be able to add these things to our, our faith. At the same time, he's saying, hey, you have a part to play. You have a job to do. I'm calling you to do and not do certain things. And in that sense, it's a discipline. So 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Here um, Paul again says to Timothy, But reject profane and old wives' fables, and exercise yourself toward what? Godliness. Exercise yourself toward godliness, for bodily exercise profits a little. But godliness is profitable for all things having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. So godliness, adding godliness to your life is also a discipline. Uh, the word here, exercise, and, and this is a verb, exercise yourself, uh, but like the, the noun form of that verb, for, in, in English, the, the word would be gymnasium. So I mean, he's, he's literally talking about, like he's making the analogy with physical exercise. Exercise yourself. I need you to work out, Paul says to Timothy. But not just physically, I'm talking about spiritually. You need to be intentional about working out your spiritual life. Exercising yourself toward godliness. 
And again, as we see in verse 8, godly exercise, if I could say it that way, a spiritual workout is profitable, he says, not only eternally, but also right now. Like there's a lot of profit in being healthy spiritually, living a godly life. Well, how, like, how is it healthy like, in a, to live a godly life here? Like, I think eternally we would get that. Go, yeah, because like, you know, if I know God, I'm going to end up there. That seems good. If I live my life in the right way, then there are rewards that God says will be available to me when I get there. Right? Whatever that's going to look like, I'm sure that's going to be amazing. Right? And that should motivate us to live a godly life. But what about right now? How does godliness help me now? Well, let's think about it this way. Think about, what, think about ungodliness. Right? What, like what, what kind of lifestyle would be an ungodly lifestyle? Well, we could probably just start naming some things. Um, someone who is a habitual liar. They, they just lie regularly. That would be an ungodly thing. Right? We'd say that's not, it's not good, not healthy. Um, some of you have, have been there, like it, probably all of it, we've all told lies, right? But, but sometimes we get into a habit of that, and man, like you find yourself in all kinds of trouble. And you don't remember what's true and what's not true, and you're trying to cover this base and that base, and lying leads to all kinds of trouble in this lifetime that we don't have to experience if instead we would just be godly instead, right? Stealing, again, be another thing that we would say certainly ungodly, um, our prisons, our jails are full of all kinds of people that thought they should take things from other people that didn't belong to them, creating all kinds of trouble for them. Sexual immorality would be ungodliness, right? Um, because of sexual immorality, all kinds of things exist in the world today that should not exist, right? I, I mean, we treat all kinds of things medically because of sexual immorality. It just, like, it just wouldn't exist if we were following God's commands. We, we would be healthier as a people right here and now. It'd be better for us if we just lived godly lives. Um, greed would be ungodly. Selfishness is ungodly. And I think you get the point. We, we can just keep adding you know, to the list of things here that when we live ungodly lives, it creates all kinds of trouble. It's not good. It's not healthy for us in this lifetime. Uh, to the contrary, living a godly life, when you live your life as an honest person, like you work to earn a living, you live in sexual purity, you are generous, you are giving of yourself to others, not living selfishly, but selflessly, guess what? Your life is going to be better than if you were choosing to live an ungodly life. And we, I think we see this practically um, every day. So there are all kinds of benefits right now and obviously eternally for living a godly life and Paul says, um, you know, just like uh, physical fitness requires some discipline and some sacrifice, the same is true for us spiritually, right? Working out spiritually also requires discipline and sacrifice. In fact, here in the passage, he says, okay, there are some things that you're going to reject. As someone who wants to be godly, there's something, you're not going to go down this road. But there are other things that you are going to do, and you're going to be diligent about that, and you're going to work hard at that. And so we're going to choose to reject some things, and we're going to choose to do better things. Here's a question for you, and I'll maybe repeat this as we wrap up here in just a minute. But, like, if you could just think for a minute, and, and I'm thinking spiritually, like, what are some better choices that you could be making right now spiritually? I mean, I bet most of us, like, you know, what, there are some things that are going to come to our mind, minds, right? Like, like, okay, I do know in reality I'm not doing this, and I should be doing this. And, and really, if I were going to make a better choice, I would be doing this. Or there are some things, like, I'm doing this, I shouldn't be. Instead of that, I'm going to add this to my life. And, and we probably could all do that, right? There are better choices that we could make. And really, that's part of exercising yourself toward godliness. It's just choosing, just like you would physically, right? If you want to get in better shape physically, you, you're going to, there are some things, like as far as food, I, I really should stop eating some of these things. And I really should start doing this instead. I really should just start making some better choices. When it comes to physical exercise, I really should, and, and we could fill in the blanks, right? Spiritually, the same thing is true. I would just start making some better choices. Um, is that easy to do? Well, it's not easy to do, right? It's, it is a discipline. Um, so godliness is a way of life. It's a personal truth, and it's a discipline. Let me give you one more. It's also a process, Godliness is a process. In fact, right here in the same passage, I want you to notice again, 
but reject um, profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself, one word, toward godliness. Maybe even circle that in your Bible. Toward godliness. I hope this is encouraging to some of you. Right? This is a process. The word toward, it's literally a, a, a preposition of direction. It's saying you're aiming in a direction. You're headed that way. You're not there yet, right? But, but that's the direction you're going. Spiritually speaking, when it comes to godliness, hopefully we're all aiming in a direction, the direction of godliness, and we're on that path. Now what that means is none of us has arrived yet, but we're exercising ourselves toward that, toward godliness, right? We're not there yet. Sometimes it's easy, easy for me, I'm, I'm surely easy for you, like to be discouraged spiritually. Like there's a place in scripture I can't, not coming to mind right now, but where, where you know, we, we know that like I ought to be further down the road than I am, right? Has anybody ever felt that way? I mean, as long as I've been a believer, I really should be further down the road. But man, I keep tripping over this, and then it got me trouble, and then this set me back for a little bit, and then this relationship broke, and then I, you know, I, I stopped coming for a while, and I kind of unplugged, and now I'm trying to plug back in, and really, and if you stop and think, you know, man, I, I should be further down the road, and we can get discouraged by that. What I want to encourage you with is just to say this, hey, listen, we're all aiming in the direction of godliness. If we're following after Jesus, it's not going to help you to get overly discouraged and beat yourself up over that. Just understand, this is where I am. Today, I'm going to start making some better choices, and I'm going to let God take me in the direction that he wants me to go as I discipline myself to follow after him, just recognizing it's a process. Right, there's, a, there's a Bible word for this. It's called sanctification. Right? Sanctification. It, it means that you're being set apart from sin and set apart for God's purposes, and that doesn't happen instantly. It happens over time. In fact, 2 Peter, or the verse that, you know, the passage we've been studying, he's talking about adding to your faith over time. Add this, and then to that you add this, and to that you add this. It, it's over time, right? God is growing us and changing us and making us into the people he wants us to be. It's a process. It's a journey. We are all at different places, right? And, and no one has yet arrived to where they need to be. Um, otherwise, you wouldn't be alive. You'd be in heaven. Well, you'd be alive in heaven, right? But you're here. So none of us has arrived. So what that means is two things. One, don't think too little of yourself, right? Um, if you, you know, you come to church and we say, hey, turn to whatever passage, and you don't know where that is yet. Like, this is newer to you. And everyone else is flying there, and they get there, and you're like, I have no idea what I'm doing, and I'm kind of lost, and you're kind of embarrassed by that. You know what I'd say? Don't think too little of yourself. We're glad that you're here. You're right where you need to be. You're here, and you're learning, and you're growing. And, and we could give all kinds of like little examples in relationships and so on. Um, don't, don't be too hard on yourself. Don't think too little of yourself. Be thankful that God loves you. He cares for you. He died for you. He lives in you. And he's wanting to take you on a journey. Um, but it also means, certainly, don't think too highly of yourself either. Right? Don't think too highly of yourself. Scripture says that very specifically. Um, because we're all on a personal journey toward godliness and we need each other to get there we, I, mean, I, it, I, I really I, I wish I knew how to convince you of that you need the people around you you need other believers in your life to get there that's why God gives us a church family so that we can grow together in him toward godliness so godliness is a way of life it's a personal truth it's a discipline and it is a process. So let's wrap this up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap this up by asking you some questions. The questions are intended to sort of provoke us in our hearts and minds to consider, okay, so what am I going to do with what God says here about adding godliness to my life? Okay, so first question is this. Do you see godliness impacting your daily life? Not just your Sunday life, but your daily life. Do you see godliness, the person of Christ, the way that you think and the way that you behave is godliness impacting your daily life. Would anyone else know that you are a Christ follower just by looking at your life? They should know. They should know at least something. Something's up with you, right? Because you speak differently. Because you're kind. Um, my son was working this week and he, uh, at work somebody said, um, he said something about you know, going to church. And he, they're like, well, you go to church? He goes, yeah, why? And they go, man, you don't seem like the church-going kind of person. I go, oh, well, like, what does that mean, you know? And so he asked, what does that mean? And, and they said, 
Man, I haven't heard you judge anybody here. Whew. So that's the reputation that godly people have. Man, we just judge everybody, put other people down, think of ourselves more highly than we ought to, right? Well, that's not where we're to be. Do you see godliness impacting your daily life? Do others see that in you? Um, another question I want to ask you is this. How personal is this for you? In other words, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? Was there a moment where you trusted him for your forgiveness? You entered into that relationship by faith. Um, if not, I mean, th that's why God has brought you here today. So you can know and hear and believe that Jesus loves you enough that he literally died for you. So that you could be forgiven. Because the Bible says the wages of sin is what? It's death. But the gift of God is eternal life. So what God wants for you is eternal life. And he gives you that when you decide, hey, you know what? If God's done that for me, I'm ready to follow after him. So Jesus, come into my life and forgive me. And you become in that moment a new creature in Christ. Have you taken the first step to put your faith in Christ? Another question. Are you putting as much time in the spiritual gym as you are in the physical gym? And are you giving as much effort to your spiritual life as you are to your physical well-being? Whether that's your physical health, um, you know, like, like personally, physically, or financially, or relationally, are you putting as much time and investment into your spiritual life? And if you're not doing either one, well, we have a double problem. Right? Um, and I don't say that to convict you. I say that to say, hey, let the Spirit of God move you and, and talk to God about that. And let's work. Let's make some better choices. Let's move forward in godliness. Um, and that's the next question. What better choices can you make in your life right now? And then the last one is this. Do you have people around you? Listen to this. Ahead of you and behind you. Ahead of you and behind you moving toward godliness. Right? Do you have people in your life that are ahead of you? You're following them. And they're helping you and they're pulling you and they're challenging you to move more into Christ-likeness. And then do you also have some people behind you in whom you are investing and you are encouraging and you're sharing Christ with them and you're living that life out in front of them and you're helping to pull them along, not against their will, of course, but with them to encourage them and bless them as they go through whatever life is throwing their way right now. Do you have some people in your life? If not, listen, I would encourage you to get into a discipleship relationship. Get into a life group. Uh, make sure that you are here and that you're coming every opportunity you can. And don't necessarily just run out the door as quick as you can to go grab lunch right after we're done. Uh, take the time to, to meet some people around you. Maybe invite them to go to lunch with you. Try to make a friend. Invest in others because we do need each other in this journey toward godliness. All right. Thank you so much. Let's pray together. Father, I just want to thank you for your goodness, for your grace, and for your mercy. And we had a chance to sing all about that today. Um, I hope that you were, were truly praised and honored and elevated because you are worthy. God, you are worthy of not just the, the praise that would come from our lips, but hopefully that praise is coming from the depths of our soul in gratefulness for who you are and for what you have done. Lord, thank you for your word that challenges us not to be content with where we are, but to be obsessed with where Jesus wants us to be and where he wants to take us. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to um, apply the words that we've heard today from your scripture. And Lord, that we would help each other do that very thing. And that if there's anybody in the room that doesn't know Jesus personally, that right now would be the moment that they choose. Enough is enough. And they turn away from their sin and they choose to give their life to you. And Lord, now that we're on this journey, so many of us in the room that have trusted Christ personally, we know the challenge that the world, uh, you know, like throws our way. And, and the culture wants to teach us and, 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 and move our hearts and minds to think differently than what you've already laid out for us in Scripture. And so, Lord, in the face of that challenge, we make a commitment to you that we're going to believe your word and we're going to trust your word and we're going to do everything we can to help each other put into practice the things that you say. Lord, not so that we could think more highly of ourselves. We've been warned against that. We don't want to be those kinds of people. We want to be the kinds of people full of grace, mercy, truth, and love. Where others could 
find a relationship with Christ and could grow in him as well. Father, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.